Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Richard Mayberry. Well, he is the uh, publisher of U.S. and World Early Warning Report for Investors. It's an excellent newsletter. It's one that I've been subscribing to for many years now, and it's one of those letters I just wouldn't want to be without. And uh, I would suggest that you should give a give a try to Richard's letter because it is absolutely excellent, as I say. And the place to go to there is earlywarningreport.com, Early Warning Report. Dot com. Thanks for joining me again, Richard. Oh, it's great to be here, Jay. And incidentally, I was reading your newsletter here uh, just yesterday. I'm really impressed with the, the job you do analyzing uh, these um, these gold and silver stocks. It's really impressive, uh, your charts and uh, your descriptions of the of the various gold veins and all in the mines. That's really great, and uh, I appreciate that very much. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, and folks, um, no, I'm not paying Richard to say that. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I... I, in all uh, in all humility, uh, exploration stocks is a very uh, you know covering exploration stocks are high risk, high reward, and when you hit, they can be very very good. Uh, but very often, the the odds are against uh, finding and outlining and delineating a, a deposit that is worthy of being mined and is, and then is economic. And then of course you have these ups and downs in the uh, in the mineral in the, you know in the prices for the minerals, and it becomes mm-hmm. uh, you know it's a high risk, high return business. So but work very hard at it and do the best I can, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you for your kind words. But I'd like to ask you today uh, to comment a little bit on some of the content of your November letter, which I understand is going to be going to press tomorrow. Now, I'd like to start out by reading a quote from your letter. America is wonderful. I would not want to live anywhere else, but its government is despicable. When Trump calls it a swamp, he's understating, end of quote. Well, before we discuss some more specific issues today, can you talk philosophically about what the framers of our Constitution had in mind for us compared to what Washington, uh, the Washington swamp, is giving us today? Right. Uh, the American founders, if you read uh, their um, their various pamphlets and articles and letters from the revolutionary period, you find that uh, they were convinced, as I am convinced, that political power is an inherently evil thing. Political power is the, the legalized privilege of using brute force on people who have not harmed anyone. Only government have that privilege. And the founders were convinced that no human can have that privilege without being corrupted by it. So they were trying to come up with a government that would be so small and in, inconsequential that no matter who got control of it, they couldn't do much damage. And that's what the U.S. Constitution and especially the Bill of Rights all about is trying to keep the government in a condition where it exists. It fills the power vacuum, but it can't really do very much. And uh, and so and the, the the government was you know very small and inconsequential up until the Civil War when it started growing like crazy. And then in the 20th century, it really took off. And today, the U.S. government, far from being small and inconsequential, is the most powerful ever seen on Earth. And um, the what a lot of Americans don't understand is that it's so powerful that it's not just the capital of America. It's the capital of a global domain, which is almost the whole world. It meddles in every country on Earth. There's no exception. Everybody is touched by decisions made in Washington, and everybody knows that all roads lead to Washington. If you're going to do anything of much importance in the world, you've got to be looking toward Washington and asking yourself, uh, how how are they going to take this, and what are they going to do to me? Americans don't understand that, but believe me, the rest of the world does. And that's why uh, there are so many millions of people who hate Washington, not just in the United States, but in other countries, too. So the, the government that we have there is not the one that is that was established by George Washington and the others back in 1790. It's something that morphed into this gigantic socialist predator um, back in the early part, mostly in the early part of the 1900s. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, <clears throat> and that's what we're living with today. This thing is not the American government. It is something that a whole lot of socialists uh, you know, warped into a Frankenstein's monster that has you know, actually almost no resemblance to the original, original plan. Indeed, and uh, George Washington not only uh, envisioned, and he and the other founders envisioned a very small not very powerful federal government I mean, they had state governments had uh, an en- enormous powers in those days, but mm-hmm. they didn't uh, anticipate any any foreign 
involvement as we have now. Washington warned us against entangling alliances in Europe, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've, uh, you know, obviously, as you just noted, we've not heeded that advice at all. And especially, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some changes that seem to be coming around now uh, geopolitically. As you say, there's lots of people around the world hate the American government because of what it does and the trouble it causes around the world and in, in seeking its own power. But um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of the petrodollar. Post Bretton Woods, 1971, gold back dollar was replaced with the petrodollar in which Kissinger and the Nixon administration made an arrangement with Saudi Arabia to make sure that the dollar continued to have value by requiring all pet, uh, petroleum sales be, be paid for in dollars. That created a, the dollar became uh, ever more powerful and the world's reserve currency. It was a strong currency before that, of course, because of our power in the world. But the petrodollar and oil is so much a part of the geopolitics of our day, isn't it? And very interesting I'd like you to talk a little bit about the Kurdistan issue that's going that is really starting to come into focus now in the Middle East because that is very much about oil. Could you talk a little bit about the Kurds, their history, and what's going on right now in the Middle East that is causing you a great deal of concern that we could actually possibly be facing another oil war of some significance? Yeah, um, and this is uh, the outbreak of this is just brand new over the last week or two. Um, I've been writing about Kurdistan since 1991 explaining this situation and you know projecting that if it continued going the way it has gone um, that we would wind up with the Mideast splintering into uh, all sorts of new small countries and there would be a tremendous amount of warfare that would probably destroy a lot of the uh, oil fields. Um, again, I've been writing about that since 1991 warning about it and it looks like in the last few weeks it has started to break out. Now you have to go back and look at the Kurds' uh, history a little bit here. Um, go all the way back to 64 B.C. Mm. The uh, Roman general named uh, Pompeius Magnus decided that the Romans uh, should start moving eastward and that they should attack the Arabs in what is now Syria. So um, Pompeius Magnus launched this invasion of Syria against the Arabs, and the war, the so-called war against terrorism that we're in today, is still that war (laughs) that was launched more than 2,000 years ago by the Romans. Amazing. Now, that, the Romans did it before there was any such thing as Christianity and before there was any such thing as Islam. Those came along later, but they started the war in 64 B.C., and then Christianity came up, and then Islam came up, and it evolved into a war between Christianity and Islam, um, and the Europeans kept at it, and they just kept pounding away at the Islamic world. And um, you come to the colonial period uh, after the Middle Ages, and they're still fighting, and the uh, Europeans now, because uh, they, Europe is where uh, the Industrial Revolution got established very early, they were extremely heavily armed now by that time, and they just swept through the Islamic world, um, massacring people by the hundreds of thousands, and taking over that whole area. Now, that's an area that goes from Morocco on the Atlantic to the Philippines, on the Pacific. Wow. And the Europeans took nearly all of that, like, you know, I don't know, 90, 95% of that, killing anybody who resisted. And <clears throat> the real tragedy for this, for America, is that the American founders were, were born in America and they didn't really have much of an understanding of what was going on over there. And when the European governments referred to the Muslims as pirates, the American founders, as much as I I admire them, they were brilliant people, but they were human and they made mistakes. And they believed this, that this was piracy going on over there. They didn't realize that this war went all the way back to... uh, 64 B.C. Mm. So they jumped into this war on the side of the European, and that was the Barbary Wars. That was the U.S. mistakenly, um, with good intentions, getting into the Europeans' war against the Muslims. So uh, we come up to, you know, the recent times here in nineteen in the 1940s, Franklin Roosevelt uh, renewed that, that uh, alliance with the Europeans and um, began really meddling a lot in the Islamic world, contributing to the chaos that the Europeans had launched all the way back there in 64 B.C. Mm-hmm. 
The Kurds, well, um, backing up a little bit, the, the Europeans, uh, after World War I, they, they took a huge part of the Islamic world, and they started dividing it up among themselves and drawing these new countries. And Iraq, for instance, is an artificial country mm-hmm. established by the Europeans. So is Syria, so is Saudi Arabia, and on and on. Uh, these are not countries created by the people who live there. They were created by the governments of Europe, not by the European people who knew nothing about it, but um, by the European governments dividing up all of the, the loot. Um, the group that the Europeans did not give a country to was the Kurds. For some reason, they just decided the Kurds didn't count. And so Kurdistan, where the, the Kurds have lived for 44 centuries, was um, divided into Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and the USSR. Um, in in the, the newsletter next week, there will be a map that will show you this. So the Kurdistan was chopped up like a pie, and pieces of it were given to each of those new countries uh, that, that the Europeans were establishing. And the, the Kurds today are the uh, re- widely regarded as the largest ethnic group without their own nation. And, and they want their own nation. They want to just be left alone to you know, live by themselves and do things their way. So we come to uh, 1922, after World War I, and they uh, launch a war against the new governments that the Europeans were created over there, trying to be able to split off and have their own country. And that guerrilla war continued until we got to, um, let's say, I don't know, about 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They really escalate a lot. After the war between um, the U.S. and Iraq, that first one, the the Kurds saw that as an opportunity to split off and um, and make their own country. They uh, they got stabbed in the back by uh, President Bush back then. He encouraged them to rise up against Saddam Hussein, mm-hmm. and they did. And then he did not give them air cover or any other kind of military support. Mm. And they were just massacred. So they don't trust the U.S. government or anybody else for very good reasons. And um, they are still trying to split off and create their own countries. Now, they they did, during this war against ISIS, manage to take um, northern Iraq and turn that into essentially their own country. It has 6% of the total world oil supply. So suddenly the Kurds have both a small country and a whole lot of money. And so they've been buying weapons like crazy, and they're preparing to declare independence, and they have done that. Uh, just about two weeks ago, I think it was, they declared independence, and then they um, uh, immediately, the government of Iraq said, we won't permit that, and they invaded Kurdistan. So. There's a war going on as we speak now, brand new war uh, with the, between the Kurds and the Iraqi government. And if the Kurds do get away with, with their independence here, what's terrifying all the governments in the world is that this, um, this movement for declarations of independence will spread throughout the Middle East. Governments of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, um, Jordan, and on and on. These are all governments that are uh, were established by the Europeans. They are the descendants of those European uh, artificial governments set up. And um, those, essentially, those countries that you see when you look at a map, like Saudi Arabia, those are artificial. Those are actually places where a single tribe, which is the Saudi royal family, conquered all the other tribes on the Arabian Peninsula and um, forced them into, with the help of the British, forced them into this um, this country called Saudi Arabia. And that's the case all through the Mideast. Uh, there are it's actually an area where natural countries are really these small microstates, these little mm-hmm. tribal areas. There's, there should be hundreds of separate countries over there. That's the natural condition of that area. There should be hundreds of separate little countries that were forced together by the Europeans for the convenience of the Europeans, Mm -hmm. and everybody's afraid now. They're all going to see the Kurds, and they're going to say, well, if the Kurds can do it, so can we. And they'll all start declaring independence, and these uh, governments, as in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so forth, will try to hang on to the land that the Europeans helped them acquire. 
So you're going to have very possibly a tremendous free for all over there. This is mm. one war after another with these little tribes trying to declare independence. Chaos. So yes, chaos, absolute total chaos is a very real possibility. And Washington and and every other government in the world except that of Israel is trying to stop this. They're trying to keep the the Kurds from being independent. And who knows where it's going to go, but you can see where it's pointed. Um, the Mideast now uh, has enough weapons in everybody's hands that all of these conquered tribes, these hundreds of conquered tribes, are thinking this is their chance to declare independence and be their own little countries. Um, and the, uh, who, who knows? I mean, it's just such a fluid situation right now, you just don't know where it's going to go. But it has certainly the potential to turn into this free-for-all that will just demolish the Mideast oil fields. And so, Rick, we, can, we, can we sort of predict that the United States will go with the rest of Europe, that it will not that it will not befriend the Kurds, that it will stand up against the Kurds? Is that a safe bet, do you think? It's actually um, already happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so it's a very safe bet. Yeah. Now, Washington announced that they're going to be neutral, and what that means is they want the present political condition to, stay. to stand. Right. And that, that means they're taking sides with the Iraqi government. So the question is, how hard are the Serbs or the Kurds going to fight? Yeah. And yeah. will this thing can continue spreading from there? There's already a movement in Iran for the Kurds in Iran to split off. Right. That's already started. Right. So um, this we're, is... you know, I mean, as we talk right here, I mean, we're right on the brink of something that, that could be, um, you know, who knows, the biggest thing since World War II. All right, I'd like to tell my listeners that uh, Rick not only has this this tremendous knowledge of history and his uh, his ability to tie it into current events, but also provides some very practical advice for his subscribers uh, in the way uh, how to invest, given the possibilities of things like this. Rick, you, I think in your newsletter you're suggesting that you know we, we're not wishing for this by any means, but it could happen that we would see a shortage of oil in the world's uh, in the world scene, and that could cause the price of oil to dry. To rise dramatically and you gave one uh, the name of one company eog resources you're suggesting could be a pretty good place to have some money parked in the event that this happens could you tell us why the eog is a north american company and um, it's um, the name of the company is eog resources the symbol is eog and because they're in north america they are you know very well separated from the chaos it's likely to break out over the they're in the old world, um, in in the Middle East and surrounding areas. So uh, any company that you can get that is uh, distant from the uh, the oil fields of of. Uh, that part of the world is likely to benefit from this, and EOG is a very high-quality company. It's a good buy, even if the war doesn't actually break out. Mm -hmm. uh, EOG is still a good long-term buy, in my opinion. So yeah, it trades in the New York Stock Exchange. Very solid company. It's around 97 bucks recently when I looked at it, so it's certainly not a penny stock, the kind that many of my listeners might be used to buying, but you're buying quality, yeah. and this would make a lot of sense, uh, I think, Rick. That's good advice. You know, also, I'm, I want to have to ask you about, you're one of the few sort of Austrian economic thinkers that pays a lot of attention to monetary velocity, and you actually every month provide your sense of where velocity is. That is, when people lose confidence in their currency, in their government, they tend to get rid of the paper currency, the fraudulent paper currency, I might add, because there's nothing really behind it. And then they, they, they buy stuff, they buy tangibles, things that retain their value. Well, oil, gold, things like that can rise very dramatically. What is your sense now, Rick, in terms of, in, in terms of that? Do you think, do you think we could be on, at the start of a, of an inflationary episode? It's not something that we want by any means, but I can tell you that I, I chart something called my inflation deflation watch and it looks like it's breaking out at this point in time. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a, um, an observation that a lot of people are beginning to make, that <clears throat> prices, well, The Economist magazine ran an article last week, I think it was, where they talked about the rising price of everything. They used the word everything. And, you know, goods, services, stocks, uh, whatever, uh, raw materials, um, anything that can't be created on a printing press, like government currency can, is going up. 
Uh, and so what's really happening is not really that these assets are going up. It's that the money is going down because there's so much of it that governments have printed over the last 10 years. Now, the reason that, that this, these trillions and trillions of dollars haven't already triggered off a runaway inflation is that they were pumped into the economy at a time when everybody was just really scared. And people, um, you know, mo- most people were very reluctant to to. Uh, spend whatever it is they got their hands on, and a whole lot of those trillions of dollars were saved, um, and it was it had the effect of, of by being saved, they're not being used in transactions, and uh, the money was essentially buried, and it wasn't part of the economy. Now it's coming out, and that's what velocity is all about: is how uh, how fast money changes hands, and it's starting to change hands now and affect prices. In every country, um, there's so much of it, not just U.S. dollars, but all currencies. All governments have printed so much of it in the last 10 years that it's, uh, you know, when it all comes out, boy, look out, Katie, bar the door. And one of the, uh, or two, let's say, well, pre- precious, let's take precious metals com- totally, uh, mm-hmm. gold, silver, platinum, palladium, all four of them are likely to just go wild if this thing really does take off, which it, it has the potential to. And you add that back with what's going on in the Mideast with right. the Kurds. Right. Oh, my gosh. So there's no, there's no um, guarantee on any of this. You know, we could be wrong about both sides of this, but um, it really is shaping up to be, in my opinion, a, a very likely that we're at the early stages of a major boom in the precious metals. Well, it could very well be, and, and you know, this is not something that you or I or any sane person wishes for, but we want to prepare ourselves for an inflationary event, We also for uh, to be prepared for, you know, bad things happen in this world, and wars are ongoing, an ongoing occurrence, and Rick, we don't have time to talk about it today. There were two topics I wanted to get to, but, you know, you're... People listening to this could subscribe to your newsletter and learn about it because I believe you're addressing both of it, both of those next week. One has to do with the H bomb and the significance of that in terms of proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. Very, very serious topic. And, and the other one I wanted to point out that you have done extremely well with defense stocks over a period of time. It's not that you're interested in helping to support companies that kill people, for sure. I know you personally, and you're not that way, but it is what it is, and we're all forced to contribute to the empire through our taxes and so forth. So, I I mean, it's a matter of self-preservation. It's a matter of doing what's right and protecting yourself and your family and so on and so forth. So we're we're really out of time, Rick. It always goes so fast with you. But I would just tell my listeners, earlywarningreport.com, sign up for Rick's letter. and I. we do have a special uh, reduced price offer on the website right now. Okay, well, wonderful. I, I, I just, you know, it's a reasonably priced letter, very inexpensive letter. Folks, do yourself a favor, do your family a favor, help to protect them, because Rick has, I mean, I I don't want to sound like I'm hyping this, because I'm just telling you what I believe Rick uh, and his work is just, his, his understanding of history, you know, they don't teach history in school anymore. They teach a revisionist mantra that is totally false in many cases. Read Rick Mayberry's letter, Early Warning Report. Report and you can't go wrong. Thanks so much for being with us. Always wonderful to have you with us, and uh, I hope we can do it again sometime very soon. 